just before I introduce Cheryl, I want to remind all of you of the Opportunity Quest uh, competition that's uh, now going on. I think the deadline for turning in your uh, little report is the 31st. Is that right, Alan? 31st of this month. So encourage all of you to do that. It's a way to earn $1,000, makes you eligible to earn $100,000 uh, if you en enter into the Utah State uh, Opportunity Quest competition. So it's my pleasure to introduce to you uh, Cheryl Snap Connor, founder and managing partner of Snap Connor PR. She has more than 22 years of experience in public relations for leading technology firms. Since 2007, Snap Connor PR has become firmly established as the fastest growing and most progressive PR firm in Utah. Connor is a regular contributor to Forbes, which is a key business magazine, as the head of communications for Allen Hall's Grow America organization. She has been recognized of one of, as one of Utah's 30 women to watch and has been named for the past five consecutive years to Utah's 100 list of top emerging entrepreneurs. She is a trustee of the Utah Technical Council and has directed the UTC Communications Committee since 2004. Let's give a hearty Snow College welcome to Cheryl Snap Connor. Hi, everybody. Whoa. More of you than I thought. This is going to be fun. Well, I'm going to introduce quick two people who came with me today who are pretty important to my company. Corey Malloy, he's running a video camera back there. He is a partner, one of the four partners of PR. And then Vic Connor, co-founder in the white shirt. He is my husband, and he and I are the co-founders. He runs the financial aspects of Snap Connor PR. So I'm excited to be here. And it's fun to talk about two of my favorite topics, entrepreneurship and public relations. So what a bonus. I get to talk about both of my favorite things. So to begin with, why become an entrepreneur? It used to be such a more rare thing that someone would finish school and just say, you know, I'm going to go directly into business. It's a different world that we're entering. Some people are innately born to be more entrepreneurial than others. We're finding in our current economy and world, the more entrepreneurial you can be, whether you work for your own company or for another company, the more entrepreneurial a thinker you are, the more successful you're going to be. We see any number of people. I don't call them out by name in my columns, but one of our nephews um, is in the final year of law school and said to us recently, I'm never going to run a law firm, probably. I maybe don't even want to practice law. And we asked him, why not? And he said, well, I've watched my father through all the years. I've seen everything that he's gone through. He said, I'm actually looking at my father-in-law as well, who worked for a major national bank. 25-year career at a bank. Very successful career. Age 52, not ready to retire because of layoffs. Now he's on his own. He's having to think of something entrepreneurial to start, not because he was, it was a lifelong dream or that it was what he had prepared to do. He doesn't have a choice. Many, many more people than there used to be in that kind of a situation. People that we've hired out of college, and so this is relevant to all of you, used to be we had a really difficult time with the people who'd come to us having a different kind of a mindset than we were able to engage with and use in the company that we have. We had an individual who was just um, thinking that public relations, for example, would be a good field to be in because he, fun personality, nice guy, got along with everybody, enjoyed people, this would be good, I'm in PR. And um, not really able to get traction and produce very much. And when we sat down and had conversations with him, he was kind of indignant and said, I have my degree. I can show you a national table that shows you I am owed 35000 a year just to walk through your door. Before I do anything, that's the level I'm at. I've been through college for four years. 
And it was pretty blunt and difficult, but I had to say to him, if you know somebody who can make a business case for you at 35000 a year, let's go. I'll give you a ride in my car. But none of that means anything to me unless you're able to produce and engage. And what you produce is what justifies us hiring you and paying you. If you fall out of that equation, there's nothing I can do to help you. So that's been an adaptation that has been hard. We thankfully are seeing much, much better mindset come out of the colleges currently. And in fact, because we're more established, we're fortunate to be able to go to BYU and to UVU about once a year and say, who's your top graduate this year, and hone in on them. But they're coming with a much different and better mindset, and we're, we're choosing and cultivating them better as well, so it's a good thing. But I am an individual who never expected in my life to own a company. I'm probably innately entrepreneurial, but it's the last thing I ever expected to do. So how did I become an entrepreneur? I'm a graduate of Rick's College. I grew up in Eagle, Idaho. If any of you know where that is, congratulations. It's not a very big town. They did acquire their first stoplight during the years I was growing up. If you've ever seen Napoleon Dynamite, that's authentic. That's why I love that movie. That's exactly how it was. So I grew up Eagle, Idaho, went to Rick's College. I was on scholarship, came home. I wanted to major in home economics. In fact, I did major in home economics, family resource management. I thought I would be a super mom, stay-at-home mom. That's what my life would be. And when I chose that major, my dad, who's owned a business all of his adult life, an electronics wholesale business in Caldwell, Idaho. And he looked at me and said, he, he wasn't going to tell me what to major in, but he said, make sure you can type and that you can keep books. If you can do those two things, whatever the world throws at you, you'll at least be able to stay on top of it somehow. And when I came home from college in the summer and I wanted to work at a fabric store, that just, you know, oh, all the fabric you can buy at a discount, my dad wouldn't let me. He took me into his electronics business and he required me to run those books. Ticker tape. You know, this was before PCs, everything that we have available now, but I learned to run those books and I grumbled every inch of the way. Now I'm grateful. It, those turned out to be fortuitous words. I ended up realizing I was going to need to work. And in fact, I was probably going to need to be the primary provider for my young family at the time. Three little boys, age four and under. So what was I going to do? Well, I, what I wanted to do then was think about, um, well, I, I could teach English. Well, I think times are better now than they were then, but um, I was interested in Rick's College or BYU. Well, it, those are private schools. They don't have to meet any criteria, and I kind of had it explained to me. Okay, you're a mom, you're a girl. For every part-time English teaching position we have at Ricks College or BYU, we have maybe 20 or 40 applicants, top of their game. So your odds are probably not high. Maybe it's better now, but private schools, you know, that just wasn't going to likely work out very well. I thought, well, maybe I can be a bookkeeper. Maybe I could be a journalist. I love to write. What I really thought would be neat and fun to do then was to work on an English master's degree. I had enough credits that I qualified as um, an English minor. Uh, most people I work with don't know that my degree was in home economics. Even people who know forget. They think that I have a degree in English. The English background saved my bacon. And I would say anybody in this working world one of the things that you should really think about and emphasize is communications. Communications and writing. Of course, I have a bias. I have a strong bias. But regardless, you're going to get a lot further ahead in the world we're in right now if you can communicate well. It's part of everybody's career. So there I was, three little boys, age four and under, needing to work, having to figure out what I could do. Well, thankfully, I could write. And at the time, one of our big tech companies in this valley, there were, well, there were two of them at the time, now there's a whole ecosystem, but there was Novell and there was WordPerfect. And I um, thought I'd maybe give my try at Novell. They had two documentation positions open. Well, there we go. That sounds like a good fit. 
Well, as good fortune would have it, the ads that went out in the paper for those two documentation jobs, the jobs had been filled, both of them, before the ad ever hit the paper. But I tried and I tried, and um, my then husband was employee number 300 at Novell, walking along, was talking to the senior vice president, and um, that individual asked him, so how's your wife's job search going? He said, terrible. She's probably going to go to Word Perfect. You know, screech. It was a Friday afternoon, and that senior vice president was up against a hurdle that my good fortune proves to have allowed to exist, because I don't know how I would have ever gotten through the door later, even a year later. But the technology industry back then was in its infancy. People didn't go to school and study technology. Well, there were technologists. Well, I guess they did. It was just an, a, a much, much earlier phase in that industry. Well, people who were good at technology didn't write and didn't communicate well. So here was a senior vice president. His name's Craig Burton. He's still an analyst, an industry analyst for Coppinger Coal. But there was nobody who could translate. We called it his Burtonese into English, into lay English, so that people would know what Novell had and be able to buy it. So he was purposely trying to find somebody who didn't grow up in the technology industry, but he felt was smart enough and could hang with him well enough to communicate what the company had into English. And so I was called in that afternoon. I was interviewed by the communications vice president. Then I was interviewed by Craig Burton. And we were, he, he was a, a really funny guy, real wicked sense of humor. And he said, so you know word perfect? And I don't know what got into me, some chutzpah of some kind. And I said, well, I will by Monday. He said, OK. And I said, OK. And I, I gave it a good college try. I certainly didn't know word perfect by coming Monday, but I'd given it my utmost. There I was at Novell. Within 90 days, I was Novell's PR manager. Didn't know a thing about PR, but was thrown in feet first, managed to hang with it. That was another advantage that I had, that as it turns out, no matter where I've worked ever in my life, I've treated it like I owned it. I didn't know any other way to be. So it was kind of a hard and scary you know, time for my poor boys growing up because I felt such personal responsibility for this work I was doing. It was hard to know how and when to, to give it up and to let it go. And a couple of embarrassing things happened later on in my life when we were um, I was trying to direct my first business partner to the Word Perfect campus. I lived in Center Street, Orem, which was not very far away. It was within blocks. It was within two miles. He said, how do I get there? I didn't know how to tell him. I'd never seen it in the daylight. I couldn't instruct somebody where to go two miles north of my house because I hadn't seen it myself. And somebody another time complained about the traffic jam getting out of Novell at 5.30, and I realized I'd never attempted it. I didn't know anything about that traffic jam. You know, Thanksgiving Day, there was a column that needed to be written, and so I, it was on my mind. I couldn't forget it. Slip in there to go finish it up, and I look up, and there's Ray Norda. Bless his heart. Loved working with Ray Norda. But the CEO was there. His executive assistant was there. I was there. We kind of exchanged a knowing look, and we're on our way. Well, in all of my time at Novell, and, and really it was a short time, it felt like decades, it was really only two years, maybe two and a half years, um, I only ever got to an annual salary of 31000 Now, it was pretty remarkable, and, and, and granted, this was some time ago, 20-some years ago, but even so, even then, that wasn't a boatload of money to raise a family on. I had started Novell at 19000 in salary, and that was actually more. The typical job would have paid 17. I was able to get 19 because I came with a little bit of extra technical smarts that they thought would give me an advantage, and I, I did my best to make good with it. So it was pretty remarkable that in two years, I'd gone from 19 to 31. In a corporate environment, that, that's pretty good ratio. Still, it wasn't that high, and so... What really drove me to leave and to go on my own was just because with three little boys, I couldn't, I couldn't keep up anymore. 
I realized how lucky I was to be in the position that I was in. The three top executives of Novell, it was a matter of policy that anything they wrote came through me. Everything that went up on the teleprompters, everything that was a newsletter, the press releases, when things were really, really touchy and difficult, those came through me. You know, I was shaken more than Raynorda was when they had to reduce the margins that they could pay distributors because we all knew that those distributors that had helped make us what we were were now, now going to have to get pinched on their margins and they were going to have to either go away or get consolidated by each other or band together into buying blocks to stay afloat. Hard, hard thing to have to do and it made me nervous to make that announcement because I knew what it meant. But I couldn't not own that. It just wasn't in me. But I realized that I could not raise my three little boys anymore and have to work the way that I worked. There was one night that was um, yeah, kind of the point that I reached that realization. I was sitting there in Novell. It was midnight. And my three little boys were underfoot under my desk because you can't get a babysitter at that hour. And, and I was pretty much on my own with responsibility for what I was going to do. And I just thought, that does it. And part of it was a little bit political, too. I had one of these hardline, hierarchical, old-school managers at the time who, you know, I was kind of like a bright, shining star, so I, I, like a star there that was a little bit of a burr in his side. And um, he wanted me to know my place. So he wouldn't approve my slide presentation until Friday at 5 p.m. and then handed me the thing, said, have it redone, and you be in New York with this 8 a.m. Monday morning. N it was not too cool. And if I'd only realized that, although maybe it's fortuitous that I didn't, I just thought, I can't do this. Here are my poor children, midnight on a Friday night, around my feet in the office. Th this can't last. So I gave my notice. Little did I know, I found out at that point, but it was too late. My decision was made that that old school hierarchical manager who holds stunts like that was on his way out the door, and the plan and hope was that I would take his place. But I thought, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm burned out. That's not for me. I need to work from home. So I worked from home, and my income immediately tripled in a day. I was really, really fortunate that everyone Novell dealt with in public relations knew that I was Novell's PR director at that point, and so they came to me. Of course, I had a lot to learn. You know, it's one thing to direct a company that's a market leader and have everyone coming to you, and your PR job is to manage it, to have them not write incorrect or negative things. Instead, now you're working with little startup companies. You're, you're only just hoping anybody would care enough to write something about them, and how are you going to break through all of that? And so I had this idea. I thought I invented it, but I, I found out later I didn't. A lot of people had this idea. Let's do a press tour. We can't just go to New York and say, your appointment's 2 o'clock, be there. Let's go office to office to where those reporters are and talk to them. And it did work very, very well. We did a lot of that for a time. We do fewer press tours now than we used to. But So I had a good business going and um, off and running out of my house. Same little boys underfoot, but at least it was our house now. Grew with employees to the point that... Um, 11 employees working out of my house. This was crazy. You know, kind of knew that I'd hit rock bottom. At that point, um, my then husband was living and working out of state, but I still needed to support my children, and the neighborhood was fortunately very, very gracious because it, I'm sure it broke zoning restrictions all over the map. But funny, funny memories of things happening, like holding a staff meeting around my dining room table, and one of my sons walks by, and his cozy favorite blanket. He's wrapped around his head like a turban, so it's a turban about this big. And he comes walking by in his blanket turban, and everybody kind of laughs, and it hurt his feelings. He cried. He says, Mom, the workers laughed at me. <laughs> he felt so bad. And then another time, we had actual cubicles above our garage, and people were selling these pages for the Novell Beetrieve Guide. So there we were. I'm talking to these salespeople. I'm talking away, and my boy and his best friend. The best friend had a black rat, and they wanted to show it to me. So anybody who's, who's going to be a mom, you know, get used to it. This is how it's going to be. Mom, 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 mom. He wanted to show me the rat. 
and I'm talking away, you know, talking to my group. Finally, I turn and look, and he's holding up a black rat by the tail, and I shrieked, scream, blood-curdling scream. The boys fled. They fled with the rat. Away they went. <laughs> the whole neighborhood heard about the whole story, about how loud I had screamed. But anyway, those were the days. So from there, my first agency of those 11 people, we did end up moving out into a proper regular business office. It grew. It became an Inc. 500 company. It became more than I could handle at that point. So burnout, complete burnout. I ended up selling out to the primary other founder partner who lived in Santa Barbara but kept an operation in Provo, Utah. That company still exists. It's called Connect. It was Connect PR. Apparently, it's turned more to marketing now. Now it's called Connect Marketing. That was my company. So I sold to the other founder and um, adopted two Russian children. So now I have five children. Those two years ended up being a saving grace because I was so burned out at that point that my health was maybe at stake. But started another agency that was affected by um, the downturn. The, the buyout of the first agency, it, um, it defaulted at the halfway point. I kind of had a sense that it might, but oh well. I was prepared for that. The two years at home were the greatest blessing I could have asked for, but I realized I needed to get my ducks in a row and have another income again. So started an agency or was invited in by two creative partners, but then when the dot-com bust happened, it took away all of that creative and graphics work ended up being taken back in-house by our corporate clients. So the only clients we had left were PR clients. So. Um, we disbanded that and went our three ways. And, you know, to have gone through the worst of economic times, and those partners um, and I are still the best of friends. So I think that speaks a lot to all of us, the kind of, kind of caliber of people they are. I still work with them, still stay in contact. In fact, one of them developed that logo, the Snap Connor logo. So um, several agencies. Missouri Wing Snap, that was in 1999, which then evolved to become PR only. Snap Norris Group SNG in 2002, um, ended up disbanding that business partnership and moving with the core group that is um, still to this day the core of Snap Connor PR. We formed Snap Connor PR April 1st, no coincidence on the day, although it is kind of funny, but 2007, we're now five and a half years old. We've won quite a few awards. We've been named top agency in the state of Utah by Utah Business Magazine. Top 25 under 5 for, for rate of growth. Um, Mountain West Venture Network Emerging Elite. And um, eight, actually last count, nine, maybe ten of our clients are currently contributing writers to Forbes and to Harvard Business Review, which is really speaking to a current trend in communications that's kind of fun. We're prevalent in multiple markets. We started out as just being tech. Now it's tech and mobile, life science business and entrepreneurship, and consumer. So why become an entrepreneur? You may have to. You will have to think more entrepreneurial no matter what you want to do. I'm the classic entrepreneur. Entrepreneurs are the people who work 80 hours a week to avoid working a 40-hour week. I will work holidays, weekends, evenings, and I'm energized by it. A woman I met a couple of weeks ago uh, there's a big, big movement afoot for first-time entrepreneurs who are age 55 and older. A lot of them, out of necessity or out of desire, are going into business for the first time right now. And she said, entrepreneurship is when you wake up in the middle of the night covered in perspiration, not because you're coming down with the flu, because you are so dang excited you just can't stand yourself. That's an entrepreneur. But ask me to show up reliably at 8 a.m. in the morning to open the office, you, you, you've killed me. I'll burn out in a week. I can't do it. I have other partners who are able to do that kind of disciplined procedural work. It's not me. Unless somebody needs to hold a meeting and it needs to happen then, of course, I'll be there. I'll try to be on time. I try so hard. I don't always succeed. But I was discouraged by corporate life. I hated the political aspects of, you know, somebody's feeling like I'm in their hair a little bit so they can throw out barriers and restrictions that make no sense at all. I hated to have to even think about that. 
I wanted to create my own future. I didn't want there to be any upside limit on it. I wanted what I felt like I could do and wanted to do and needed to do for my family to be my only limit. And the chance to do innovative and compelling work. Now, it does come with its own responsibilities. You know, I don't have a boss, but in a sense, I have about 30 bosses because we have to report to our clients. You know, they are our bosses. They are our lifeblood. We would not exist without our clients, and so we have to respect those relationships. I have run into no real barriers for being a woman entrepreneur. Honest, it's not a problem. And in fact, occasionally it's an advantage. You know, I'll be honest about that too. That um, we were able to get into our own building space partly because Zion's Women's Financial Group helped us. They said, you're a woman-owned business, right? And I said, well, oh, yeah. You, it was just coincidental, you know, you know, or, or co-founded, of course, with my husband. We're co-owners. But that was close enough. They said, okay, you're in. They helped us. And it helped us secure the loan in a bad market that purchased our building space. I do struggle a little bit with this whole idea that um, I don't want to fall back on this excuse of, well, you're a girl, so people probably aren't expecting that much, you know doesn't fly. If my family is making the sacrifice and commitment for me to do this, I need to make it worth their while that they did. I need to not fall back on any excuses, but to do everything I'm fully capable of. So that's how I became an entrepreneur. Um, before we move a little bit into public relations, does anybody have questions? So far so good? Okay. Whether or not you ever decide to go into a career in PR, the more you know about PR, which is evolving into the whole breadth of communications, the better off you're going to be wherever you work. So used to be that public relations was putting out a press release and then simultaneously doing all kinds of pitching, 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 pitching to the reporters to persuade them and convince them to cover your stories. It's still all about but it's also much, much more. So we used to count our success by the number of hits we'd get that we successfully persuaded a reporter to cover our news because they didn't have to. They don't owe us anything, but if we were successful in being on the spot, compelling enough story, persuading them, and getting more than our share of the fair airplay, that was good. There are so many mediums right now. There is social media. There are blogs. There are so many more broadcast avenues because it's not only your local stations or even the national syndicates. There are all kinds of online corollaries to that that create so many opportunities. So to do something successful and really meaningful, it's really, really interesting. We talk about a phenomena called thought leadership. You hear this thrown around in communications and PR all the time, thought leadership. People don't want to hear you promote your product, but they'd love to hear what you're expert in. If you were expert in something, presumably the area that creates the need for your product, they'd love to hear about that. So it's far more beneficial to be able to provide a valuable contribution that isn't purely self-promotional. Doing that will give your company and your business more success. We also talk a lot about advertising versus public relations. What are the reasons you purchase a good or a service? I'd like to ask if anybody knows. What's your guess? Why do you buy something? Yes. It fulfills a need. That's good. Yes. It looks interesting. How do you make the decision? What seems to be the most likely option? Price? Who would you go to or where would you look? Online? Okay, you're getting warmer, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give it away. In research, y and you, you may not be surprised, but word of mouth. Word of mouth would be the single biggest reason you would go purchase a particular product or service. So that means that whatever public relations is most akin to word of mouth is going to be most influential to you. A paid ad ranks number seven. 
well down the list. Now, advertising still does have its purpose. It's a different purpose. That means that if somebody puts out a press release, it's rah, rah, we've got this new product. It can do this. It can do it that fast. It's not going to be nearly, nearly so influential as a press release that is more like an article. And in fact, more like, we call it a case study. If there were a story about a user or a customer or a company like yours, what did they do when they had this concern or problem? How did they decide? Not the testimonial kind of, it was a silver bullet, it can do no wrong, but really, who did I have to convince? Where were their hiccups? How much money did I have to pay? If I installed it again, what would I do differently? The things you'd tell your best friend. If you can find more of that kind of real information, it's more compelling. Plus, a few of you said social media and internet. So think about this. If somebody wants to shop for a product, and the first thing they do is an internet search, especially if it's an unusual product, so it's in a category they didn't realize existed, didn't know about before, they run an internet search next. So consider whatever falls in the main part of that search result page the due diligence. If they read or hear about your company or product two or three times, preferably three, it's the law. They're sold. Yep. Confirmed it, confirmed it, confirmed it, and it was the press. It wasn't the advertisement that the company put out. That's what will convince them. So PR could take so many forms. Media coverage, contributed articles, thought leadership blogs, Ebooks. I think everybody knows what an ebook is. Video on YouTube channels, company blogs, email lists, all of these things have a role in social media. So imagine for a minute if you've got a little company, you've got a startup, off we go, we've got funding, product, here we go, but we don't have anybody in the company since it's only two people doing PR and we can't afford an agency. You've got a hurdle. You have to get around that somehow. You have to figure out what you could do at least by yourself. And if you don't do anything, and it's surprising how many companies get to a surprisingly big size and they'll either go in fits and starts, they'll put out a bunch of news, and then nothing. Well, then that sort of is the news. Sounds like you're scrambling with your heads down trying to figure out what sticks. But if these companies would put out even periodically something, that communicates their business effectively. You know, like one financial analyst one time told me, he says, you know what, throw us a bone. Too many of these companies I'd be glad to invest in, but if I'm the only one who knows about it, it's going to do me no good. doesn't matter if they've impressed me, I can't invest. So put out a communication here and there, or, you know, how many companies, if they didn't proactively do at least something effective with their PR, somebody runs a Google search, what you're going to find is maybe the couple of unhappy customers they ever had have now been allowed to define that company's brand for them. That's terrible. So even doing a few simple things, a company could get so far ahead. Boy, this is a phenomenon. I didn't major in PR, even if I had. It wouldn't have taught me any of what we're doing now. We're having to relearn it. We're having to rewrite the rules every single week. So PR right now is one of the things that drives leads to the sales for a company. That's an amazing thing. And in fact, for the first time, this is kind of a milestone. It happened just a week and a half ago. The first company who come to us who hired us under their SEO, their search engine optimization department, not under their PR. It's a company that has a tricky brand that most of their sales happen through partners and are called different things. So doing classic PR kind of doesn't work for them. But they can do columns, thought leadership articles, which can syndicate, which can produce leads, SEO traction. That's what they're hiring us to do. Social media is a mouthpiece for PR. Um, Facebook. Twitter, all of those things, if you don't know how to run them, and all of you do, statistically, without even asking for a raise of hands, it's your world. You couldn't avoid it if you had to. But all of the things that you need to do and need to think about, 
but that content right now, we call it content. What we mean when we say content is books, articles, blog pieces, things that are updates that you put on social media. All of that is content, and content is the king. So here's a case study, a little bit of a case in point. One of the companies that we work for named Fishbowl. They are pretty smart, headed by this man, Dave Williams. He was actually working for a team of investors and was sent in 2004 to shut this little company down. Handful of people. The investor had invested 325000 couldn't invest anymore. He says, you know what, just close them. Well, he went in there when he saw that handful of people working for free, so close to getting a product out, saw what they had, was so compelled, he called the investor back up and he said, will you give me a few more weeks? If you will, I promise you, you'll never have to put in another penny. Took hold, inventory software, grew like crazy, and this man, it speaks to his integrity and character too. A lot of times you hear trouble about people manipulating their company so that they produce as little dividend as possible. He said, I got to write dividend checks to that investor. That was so much fun. This is a sense of personal mission. They had a million dollars in the bank when the downturn hit. Wow. So you're thinking, who could be better prepared? Nothing could hit them. Nothing could go wrong. They doubled down on their marketing when nobody else could. Their biggest former competitor died. Their second biggest competitor severely contracted, became a non-issue. They were on top of the world, but something could happen and did, and that was that this investor had a reversal and needed to liquidate. He owned 78% of the company, and he just said, I'm, I'm sorry, I've got to get it back out, so, you know, whatever you got to do. Well, you would think that's not a problem. No problem. We'll get another investor. Nope, we're in the middle of the recession. The investors are walking around picking off distressed sales like plums off the ground. That's not going to work. Plus, this band that had grown up together, they wanted to stay together. They didn't want to get acquired by a bigger entity. They wanted to run their own future still. So that wasn't going to work. There was no exit strategy. As they put it, the exit strategy is death. So that's not going to work. Well, okay, go to the bank and get a loan. Again, <laughs> dead end. That poor company went through all of the paces. They did get an approval from Zion's bank, but it was one of these nightmare months longer than you would have thought it would have been, even though they ended up being the only loan, enterprise loan Zion's funded that year. So at the zero hour, you know, five months past where they thought they would be, and Zion's calls up and says, good news, we're ready to go, but it's for 500000 less than we told you. Rules changed. Sorry. Here they are. You know, inch of their life. All the CEO could do, and by then there was a president as well. She had come in to help them with this cause. Go to the executive team and say, here's where we are. All ideas welcome. There were people pulling out checkbooks. They were volunteering to take pay cuts. They made it. They made it. They did the buyout, and they did it during a month that they hit record sales. Wow. So we sat there looking at each other afterwards and said, so nobody's ever going to believe this. I said, you know, this one's a case study for Harvard Business Review. And then, you know, kind of being impetuous, it's like, so what's stopping us? Let's go do that. So the next time we went on their press tour with their product news, we went to Boston, we visited Harvard Business Review, and realized pretty quickly, well, maybe we really don't want to do this. Maybe it's not that smart to go shine a floodlight on our most vulnerable hour. Maybe instead we'd rather wait a little bit and talk about the things that are going really well now that we did buy ourselves back, which we did. We got them featured in Inc. Magazine. We started to write regular online columns from the president and CEO. We were able to then get them into Forbes. Now you run a Google search on that company's name. Now think about it. They've got a very generic product, inventory software. Even Inc. Magazine, you know, they've been on the Inc. 5,000 five years in a row, calls them 174th in their category. So the first time they had an article, and it was not about inventory control software, it was about leadership principles. It went viral. It got about 130,000 views in the course of just a couple of days. 2,000 hits a day to their website that they didn't have before. 
and their position, if you, we, we call it a search engine optimization position. They were showing up 17th, which was pretty remarkable. The day the article went viral, they're sixth. So we would think, and anyone might think, so what does that mean? You know, it's probably going to go back down tomorrow because that article is only going to have a shelf life of what? A day. It continued to rise because they're continuing to write. They've developed a following. Now they're position number one. You could not buy that kind of credibility with any amount of ad dollars or even effective PR, and we think we're pretty darn good, even at the traditional stuff. Amazing, amazing thing. The most recent outcome, we've had that CEO, Dave Williams, he's been on CNBC, he's been on Fox News, and a week ago he signed a book contract with Wiley. He's going to write a book about their principles, and starting next year, knock on wood, that book will go out with every software purchase and every upgrade. So they're renowned, nationwide, worldwide, and that's how it started. Ebooks, very, very big thing. I'm just going to spin through some of these ideas, but anybody who wants to know more of them can talk later. Um, imagine giving somebody a book on topics that are kind of giving away your smarts for free. Smartest thing they could do. Anybody who takes one of their free ebooks, 37% of the time, this company, Inside Sales, they work out of the Nobel campus. They'll close 37% of those. Amazing. Pretty good deal, giving away that wisdom. They've done some smart things with it. So PR is so much more valuable than advertising when it comes to straight lead generation. And in fact, even when somebody advertises, we tell them to put that ad way far away from whatever article about them might be in the same book. So it can kind of maybe be like two sightings of the company. And if you put that article right next to the ad, it's going to look like it's part of the ad, like it's an advertorial, and we don't want to give away that credibility. So these are the kind of things that PR can do. The third one, um, I can tell you who it is. It's Wilson Electronics. What is more boring than a cell phone signal booster? I tell you. But our partner in our agency has managed to just create gold. Biggest sales days, they do some ingenious things at the Computer Electronics Show. Biggest sales days of their life. And the things that they hear from the CEO of that company, I prefer PR over advertising because it works. So done right, PR drives business results. You should all be thinking about PR. Too many companies still think that it's, well, can we get an intern to do that? Or we can't afford to start it yet. It's really a broader thing. Communications is tied into every aspect of your business. So that's who we are. It's what we do. And I welcome any thoughts, questions, or things that you'd like to ask. Yes. Do I work more hours now than then? Fewer. Um, I maybe work roughly the same hours, but a world of difference is that it's the hours of my choosing. If you work for a company like Novell, think about it. There were senior vice presidents who um, would stay all hours of the night, and it would be kind of a bad thing because if you needed them, you had to stay to get the information you needed, but they could sleep in the next morning. But as an employee, we couldn't. These days, I don't have to do that anymore. You know, I, I can run my schedule around what I need to accomplish for my clients instead of around somebody else's rules about what office hours are. Any other questions? Yes. My 30 clients are like bosses, yes. How do you not get burned out by having 30 bosses? When you figure it out, let us know. Um, seriously, we, we have to come to a point where we can set boundaries and keep them. We manage our clients as much as they manage us. There are things that we can do. We could start to train them, and we do it in a courteous way. That's part of public relations, too. That, so I can be more effective for you. I'm going to 
line up your questions and I'll answer them all at 3 o'clock rather than being interrupt driven all day long. Um, if I can answer an emergency call after hours, I will. If I can't, I won't. I've won contracts before because somebody with an emergency called at 1030 and he said, you picked up the phone, you got the deal. But he ended up being a very high maintenance client and I'm kind of glad I don't have them anymore. But um, we have to manage ourselves and our time. There are some challenges, you know, they are our bosses. If they have an emergency, we have an emergency. But we have to manage the kind of human imposed emergencies wisely, which is, um, you know, for example, think about if I report to somebody in that organization and basically they hired me, they're my boss. If I have to go over their head to the CEO, I'm going to have to do that pretty darn carefully. I'm, I'm playing with fire. And in this world too, people move around and it, I joke that it's a small world and Utah is even smaller. The person I accidentally or out of necessity offended one day could be my boss or deciding the future of my contract and another deal tomorrow a.m. So you always have to bear that in mind. But we try to set our own limits. what our clients might be, what kind of companies or what kind of, generally it's companies, quite often it's a product company, sometimes it's a personality like a book author. Um, we represent more people, people, individuals as the entity in the product than we used to, or associations, Grow America, we're the agency of record for Grow America, I even hold the role of VP of Corp Communications for Grow America, and in fact when I write for Forbes I'm writing really through that office and nobody considers that unusual. It's a different world that way. In fact, several of our partners as clients or as the agency will take on temporary roles like the acting VP of marketing for Multiling. We hold that role right now. One of the senior individuals does. So it could be any kind of a company ranging from a startup to an individual to a public large enterprise. How does a PR firm price their services? That's a really good question because it is all over the map. Um, we do charge a regular budget. The classic model is that a PR agency would charge a retainer, which would be a sum of, it might be $3,000 or it might be $5,000, and then kind of like a law firm. Law firms are pretty analogous. You would be billing your time against that retainer. Well. In the boom times, what tended to happen was that the agencies would be kind of lackluster and complacent about what happened with that base budget. They'd consider it an annuity, like a birthday present, and then they'd really start to get serious at, we call it the oops, the out of programs, the work authorizations we're throwing at them for things that weren't covered by that retainer budget. That's the kind of thing that um, I would say you don't want to get into as an agency because it's going to it's going to hurt your reputation. It's pretty much a non-issue these days because times are so hard. People now want to pay us a set budget and want the sun and the moon and the sky, and so it's up to us to set the limits. And and we do so we do so carefully, but um, really we work from a set budget that we put in place. It's quite typical these days for us and many others that you, you put that initial time period of contract in place and when it expires, it kind of renews itself monthly from then on. That you don't go to more paperwork. You know you've got a rhythm down and if you're not worth your salt every month, you're not going to stay there. That going back to contract is in many cases more unwieldy than it's worth. We've got partnerships for life with companies like Fishbowl, for example. I don't give it another thought. Yes. How closely related is marketing and public relations? So close they overlap. They're intertwined. They're not exactly the same thing, but they certainly are very closely related. Generally speaking, we report to the marketing VP. What are the differences? Marketing, in its true sense, would be the market research to decide what does my customer market look like? How big is it? How much can I secure of it? What is my due diligence? What product features must I have? What are nice to have? All of the product design, the product life cycle, that's marketing. Where PR would be, 
when you've made those decisions, how are we going to effectively communicate it to the world and leverage it to your advantage? So that's why marketing kind of falls first. <laughs>